Thank you very much, Julian. That was a very kind and warm introduction. I'm going to fly you through uh, a bunch of different areas today. We're going to look at, uh, is blue light dangerous? Can macular pigments help protect the retina? And can we measure macular pigments and assess them in the eye and then do something about it? So the take-home message for today's talk are these four things. First of all, that blue light is dangerous, despite what you might have heard and some confusion, which I'll try to clear up. Secondly, that reactive oxygen species are causative both in aging and age-related macular degeneration. And that macular pigments can help protect the retina from blue light and reactive oxygen species. And finally, that macular pigments differ between individuals. They're modifiable and measurable. I want to give you two quotes. One is from Professor Stephen Beattie in Ireland, who says that AMD is the cost of doing business with the sun. And the reality is that too much of a good thing is a bad thing. And that is the case with sunlight, for sure. The other one is from a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Gary Misson, who's an ophthalmologist. And he's often asked by his patients, will I get AMD? And his answer is always the same. The question is not, will you get AMD, but when will you get AMD? And that's because AMD is the natural process of aging of the eye. We will all get AMD if we live long enough. The trick to prevention is about delaying the onset beyond our lifespan, and that's really the key. So everything we can do to delay the damage and stop some damage will help us prolong our vision. So I'll talk to you today about some of the things that we can do. So just to give you a bit of background on myself, Julian's already said, I've had the privilege of working at fantastic universities around the world on various different topics, um, from corneal surface microstructures to vision uh, differences in color vision across the retina to sensitivity to polarized light. And my recent research into um, perception of polarized light by humans has led to an entirely new way of assessing macular pigments using new technology. And the University of Bristol patented that technology. And then we've now since started a company to turn that research into a clinical device that you can use to assess macular pigments in your patients. And this allows you to measure their macular pigments in less than a minute. It's fast, easy, and affordable. Um, and most importantly, it's repeatable. And that's really critical when you're measuring macular pigments. So the outline for today's talk then is to look at blue light and some of the confusion around blue light. What is it? How is it dangerous? Reactive oxygen species, again, how are they created? Uh, what damage do they do to the retina? And what's the relationship to age-related macular degeneration? We'll also look at macular pigments, what they are, where they're found, and how they protect us. And then look at how we go about assessing macular pigments in a clinical setting. So we'll start with blue light. So I'm sure you've all heard about the Boots um, blue light lens coating scandal, where they, were, they had some advertising, and that advertising made statements along the lines of modern gadgets give off blue light that can cause retinal cells to deteriorate over time. And the second part was that, that blue blocking lenses could filter out this harmful blue light. And the ASA and the GOC said, look, there's a lack of evidence that exposure to blue light over time causes retinal damage. But there's some confusion there, because the key witness that the GOC brought in was Dr. Tom Margrain from Cardiff University. And his statement that's in that same hearing says, the major risk factor for AMD is sunlight. And that it's the blue part of the spectrum that's most likely to cause the damage. So on one hand, they're saying there's no evidence, or there's a lack of evidence. On the other hand, someone's saying, the key witness is saying, no, blue light is dangerous. So what do we do with that? How do we go forward? These challenges, this confusion has been perpetuated. So the statement that's presently on the AOP's website, their position statement on visible blue light, is also confusing. Because it talks about visible blue light, but then it shows a picture of a computer monitor. Now, computer monitors do put out blue light, but it's such a small amount that this is not where our concern is. Our concern is really natural light for the most part. So what is it that they're talking about? Is it computer digital controlled light, or is it blue light? And is it really dangerous? And the statement that they have that says the AOP concludes that there's insufficient evidence to support the contention that visible blue light exposure from digital devices can lead to ocular damage to the eye and eye health. And that suggests it's digital devices. But further down the same document, it says there's no evidence that visible blue light causes eye disease in humans. And I'll tell you right now, that's simply not true. So the statement needs to be clarified, and they need to be very clear about what they're talking about. Is it digital light, or is it blue light in general? And here's a, just a short list of some papers that all prove very clearly that blue light is dangerous, for sure. And I'll go through some of that with you now. So, but first off, what does a lack of evidence mean? So, what people have been saying is we need a controlled study in humans to show that blue light causes damage over time. And I ask you to consider, what would a controlled study in humans to show long-term damage in eye health look like? 
So this is, we're talking about a cumulative damage through your life, a controlled study in humans. So we're looking at a study that's probably going to last 65 years before you start to get Drews in an AMD. I can tell you right now as a researcher, the most funding you can get is for five years at a time. Most of the time it's three. So no one's going to fund a 65-year study for starters. I'm not going to start a 65-year study. I don't have time. I'm not going to live that long. And next of all, you have to have enough people. So there are so many variables. So how would I control a population of people? If I took 1,000 people and said, I'm going to put you in an experiment, I'm going to control everything in your life, your diet, whether you smoke, your genetics, uh, how much exposure you get, your behavior, all these things. It's not, it's not feasible, and it will never happen. We will not have that experiment. But that experiment's going on right now. You're all part of that experiment. And we can do ep look at epidemiological results to look at what's actually been seen by people now when they've got AMD and what they did through their lives. So I think the important thing here is that a lack of a controlled study doesn't mean that something's untrue. And I think that's critical. If you think back, so a great comparison is smoking. Prior to the 1930s, there was no strong evidence that smoking caused cancer. In 1930, the first control study came out, and suddenly there was evidence. Now, sadly, it took another 50, 40, 50, 60 years for governments around the world to start doing something about the fact that they knew smoking caused cancer. And it's only now that we're seeing legislation put in place. We don't want to wait that long for blue light, trust me. But the key thing there is that before 1930, did smoking cause cancer? There was no controlled study that said it did, but of course it did. It always has. So what kind of evidence do we have, then, that blue light is dangerous? Well, let's first define what blue light is, because there's obviously some confusion. Blue light doesn't just come from computer screens and phones um, and other sources like LED lights and compact fluorescence. It's all around you all the time. Anything you look at that's white is white because it has all the colors, or at the very least it has blue, green, and yellow, and stimulates your three key cone types. So visible blue light is at the short wavelength end of the spectrum. It's the high energy visible light, the short wavelength light. And it's very close to ultraviolet. And when we think of light as a wave, it's a continuous, the electromagnetic radiation spectrum is continuous, and the wavelengths change length. But there's no cutoff. We've created this term blue light. It's our own fictional definition of what blue is. It doesn't truly exist, it's just another wavelength. And it's on the short wavelength ends, the ultraviolet, and x-rays, we know they're dangerous. You put on a, a lead bib when you go to get your x-rays, because x-rays are dangerous. You put on sunscreen to protect yourself from ultraviolet. And blue and violet are just the next part of that spectrum, and they're still dangerous. And I'll show you how. So the eye, the cornea and lens block most of the UVA, uh, UVC, UVA and UVB. So not very much UV light gets through to the back of your eye. And the infrared is blocked by the aqueous humor. So what you're left with is your visible light, and that spans the spectrum from violet through to deep red. Now, when we think of light as a wave, we have the wavelengths, but you can also think of waves as a light as a particle. So it can be defined as a particle or a wave. And when we think of light as a particle, the smallest indivisible part of light is called a photon. And each photon carries with it a certain amount of energy, and that energy is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So short wavelength light has high energy, and long wavelength light has low energy. And the reason you can't see in the infrared is because infrared photons don't carry enough energy to isomerize your visual pigment. So you can't see infrared. Some animals can see infrared. And the reason you don't see ultraviolet is because it doesn't get to your retina. Now, is blue light and ultraviolet light dangerous? Well, the International Standards Organization certainly thinks it is. That red line shows you which every device, uh, medical device for, for um, looking at uh, vision, has to uh, abide by. So that red line shows you what is called the aphakic light hazard. So this is if you haven't got a lens, the light that will damage your retina. And you can clearly see that in the ultraviolet, it's very strong. But it carries through all the way to 500 nanometers. If you then take into account the fact that the lens and the cornea are absorbing light below 380 nanometers, then what you're left with is what's called the retinal light hazard. So this is the part of the visible spectrum that's dangerous to your retina. And indeed, it goes from 400 to 500 nanometers, with a peak at about 440. And that's really where the key danger is in that short wavelength end. But it, there's no cutoff. There's no, art, there's no artificial cutoff we can put there. So what kind of damages occur? Well, there's two types of damage. There's um, photo, it's all called photochemical damage or phototoxicity. And there's two types. There's type two, which is 
high intensity, short time periods. And there's type one, which is low intensity, long time periods. And I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about type two, because that's where a lot of the research has been done. Because for obvious reasons, short time periods are a lot easier to study than long time periods. So this research, there's lots of papers out there from about 1970s when they started, when the lasers were invented. People were very keen to understand what danger can lasers pose. And what they did is they looked at lasers of different wavelengths and they shone them into the eyes of animals. They didn't do it in humans, so this has never really been done in humans. So it's research that we depend on, but it's still done in animals. To be fair, there was some research done in humans that were having their eyes enucleated because of tumors, but I won't go into that. At any rate, the important thing here is that wavelengths of, in the green light, 533 nanometers, were 20 times less damaging than wavelengths at 440 nanometers. So that blue light at 440 is much more dangerous than green light. And that's the key take home for that. And in short time periods, you can do a lot of damage. So what does it look like then for long-term damage? Well, the challenge we have is that people aren't doing those 65-year studies to show you what the damage looks like. And even if they did, there are so many variables that would play into it that we wouldn't have one simple curve we could point to. But we do know some basic facts about this long-term damage. First off, we know it's the short wavelengths that cause the damage. That isn't different between short-term and long-term damage. It's the same wavelengths. They're still high energy, whether you see them in a short burst or over time. The second thing is that it's all about exposure. So unlike, so it's cumulative, so unlike heat, so if you sat in a bath at 35 degrees Celsius, you could sit there almost indefinitely, and as far as temperature is concerned, you're perfectly fine, despite the fact that it's 35 degrees Celsius. If you multiply by, by three, you'd be over 100 degrees Celsius. That would be a problem. But it's not a problem to sit at 35 degrees Celsius indefinitely. But if you get to 43 degrees Celsius and you sit there for a while, your core temperature rises and now you're causing thermal damage. That's the difference. Thermal damage requires a threshold that you must exceed before you cause damage. If you're boiling water, it doesn't boil till you get to 100. After that, increase it, it just gets hotter. But nothing happens before 100. It's different with short wavelength. Phototoxicity is not like thermal damage. Every photon has a probability of causing damage. Every photon has enough energy to do some damage to your eye. And so it's cumulative through time. So what you need to do is look at the exposure. How long and how intense is it? So if we think about that probability of damage, the reason that there's no one equation for this is that the probability of damage is based on a lot of different things. The, the molecule that the light's interacting with, the pH around that molecule, the temperature of the molecule, the orientation of the molecule with respect to the light coming in, all of those things can affect the likelihood that that blue photon causes damage. So what we get is a probability function. It's like a Gaussian curve that says, look, there's a probability that damage will occur at this wavelength and give or take some. So it's a bit like looking into the night sky. If I were looking into the night sky, and it's mostly black and a few stars, and I pointed my finger randomly at a point, and I said, okay, do I hit a star? The chances are I don't hit a star. And if we call hitting a star causing damage, I'm lucky. I, probability was low, and nothing happened. Fine. But we all know that the, s the space is infinite. And if I kept going on that straight line, eventually, with enough time, I would hit a star. That's the probability of damage, right? Eventually, with enough time, enough photons, you will cause damage, even at low exposure, low intensity. But if we increase the intensity, the likelihood of me pointing in that sky and getting light is really high. So if I blast a laser into your light, it's guaranteed I will do damage, I promise you. I could shine this red laser, but it won't do any damage. It's red light, it won't hurt you. All right, so what's the evidence then that light over time causes damage. And it comes from a lot of different places. So we've got fantastic work in humans, epidemiological studies, looking at people that spent a lot of time in the sun. So people that spent leisure time in the sun or the military, and what they've shown is that the types of damage occurring in their eyes is identical to that that happens when you do short-term damage in a monkey's eye. So that suggests the same things are happening. Second, there's a fantastic study that I'll talk about a bit later by Fletcher, where they showed that, in fact, if you're exposed to blue light, in through life, and you have low macular pigments, the probability of damage is much higher. And I'll talk about that in more detail. A really good study by Sui et al. that looked at meta studies. So it looked at, there was a meta study looking at many different studies, and it found that the odds ratio for AMD was 1.4 for people that were exposed to sunlight. And we know that the blue light is the part we're worried about with sunlight. And then there's been RP studies, there's been in vitro studies, cell culture studies. They all show the same, the basic mechanism of what's going on. And there's been really good work done in primates. 
But all that can be summarized. If you wanted to just read one or two papers, the papers by Bolton, Margrain, and Wu, these are reviews that look at the fundamental things that are happening in the eye with damage. And they look at the retinal that can become a reactive oxygen species, the lipofusin, the melanin, the RP, and they talk about all the different ways that damage can occur. So I would direct you to those, and I'm happy to share them with you if you can't get them. All right. The second objection that the GOC had with the, the advertisement that Boots put out was they said that it, it, the statement said that these blue blocking lens filters filter out harmful blue light. And it kind of sounds like they filter out all the light. But we know they don't really filter all the light. You wouldn't see blue at all when you put the glasses on. In fact, they only filter between 10 and about 35%, depending on which kind you get. But the question is then, is there evidence that that stops disease? And I'll tell you, there is no double-blind, placebo-controlled study that proves that reducing blue light results in ret uh, reduces retinal damage. And we know why. The same reason. We're talking about lifelong studies that require 65-plus years to see that reducing blue light won't cause damage. So we shouldn't expect those to occur. But what evidence do we have? Well, we know that blue light's the dangerous part of the spectrum. We know it causes damage to the retina. So the question then is, does reducing blue light reduce the probability of disease? Remember what I said about exposure. It's all cumulative, so it's all about exposure. There's a probability function which we'll ignore. The main thing is it's intensity times time. So if I can reduce one component of that equation, the intensity side, then I reduce the probability of damage. It's that simple. It's a cumulative thing through life. So you expose, so for myself, I wear blue block lenses for a reason. If I'm gonna be lucky enough to live 100 years, and I'm going to be exposed to a certain amount of light through my life. The average person starts to get serious drusen or AMD at 65. If I can reduce the exposure to blue light by 20%, then can I add 20%, 20 more years to my life with good vision? I'm happy with that. If I can not get AMD till 85, that's way better than 65. So for me, it's, it's a really simple thing to do to extend my likelihood of seeing well into the future. And again, the lack of a controlled study doesn't mean it's untrue, and that's really important to think about. Okay, back to objection number one. One of the key components of that was the modern gadget statement, and I think this is where there's still some confusion. Is it modern gadgets that are causing a problem? So Mike Kilpatrick, who's actually in the audience here, he's, a, he's an optometrist from Bath, he came to me a couple of years ago and said, look, you're a visual ecologist, you can measure lights. Um, how much light comes off of a computer or a phone? Are, are they actually dangerous? Is there enough blue light there to do something? And I thought, well, let's find out. So I've got all the equipment. So we made absolute spectral intensity measurements of a phone, a computer, the sky at 8 p.m., at 4 p.m., and sunlight reflecting off of some paper. And what you can see in this plot is that, sure enough, there's a lot of blue light there between 400 and 500 nanometers for all of those light sources. They definitely have blue photons. And if you get enough exposure, enough intensity over time, they could cause damage. But what's really important is to put that on a scale where you can actually see what's going on. Let's put that on a normal scale rather than a log scale. Suddenly now, look at the sunlight. Sunlight is two to three orders of magnitude greater than a phone. You get the phone line are those two bottom red and green lines. They're just at the very bottom. They're perfectly flat. They don't show up. So what that tells us is that while there is blue photons there, and we should be aware, the intensity is so low that it's probably not a huge damage. And to put that into context, if I were to take a 20-minute walk in the snow or on a beach towards the sun and the light's coming into my eyes, the number of photons that I could measure there would be the equivalent of about 133 hours of looking at a phone at a normal distance. Okay? So these things are not really that dangerous. That's five and a half days of looking at your phone for a 20-minute walk outside. I know which one I'd rather do. However, whichever one I'm doing, I should be conscious of the fact that there's a lot of blue photons there and I should be doing something about it. So the advice that I always give is wear a hat. Put on your sunglasses, blue blocking lens coatings. Make sure you've got enough macular pigments. It's really important to protect our eyes through the long term. The other thing about devices is you can change how much blue light they put out. If you take your phone, you can put on these filters electronically that'll turn down the color temperature and get rid of almost all the blue light. Not all of it, but most of it. If you turn all of your monitors to 3500 Kelvin, if I come and measure them for you, you'll see there's almost no blue light left. All right, they look really yellow, but it works really well. So you don't need to spend a lot of money to protect yourself. Okay, so once again then, can these devices cause damage? Well, it's about exposure. If your kids are sitting there playing video games for 16 hours a day like this, then we don't know. I mean, it, it could be that over time that will cause damage, and we're a living experiment. So I'll tell you in 65 years from now whether that's going to cause a problem. But most importantly, once again, the lack of a controlled study doesn't mean it's untrue, and I would be cautious of it because we don't really know for sure. Saying that it does or doesn't, I don't want to say that yet.
I'd be willing to say, I'm not sure, and therefore I'm going to take preventative action because it's so easy to do. All right, let's move to the next section, reactive oxygen species. What are they? How are they caused? A reactive oxygen species is a molecule or atom that's become reactive. It's like a naughty kid in class that's going around trying to cause problems. And they can be formed via a variety of things. They can be formed chemically. So smoking releases reactive oxygen species in your system. Your body naturally releases them through metabolism. But importantly, they can also be created by light. So photons that have below 2.5 electron volts, which is about 590, 570, it's not a clear line there, but in that area, have enough energy to ionize a molecule, which means that in that picture on the left, they cause the atom to emit one of its electrons, and it becomes charged, and it wants to get that electron back. So it's typically oxygen, and it moves around trying to steal an electron from someone else. And when it does that, it causes damage. So what kind of damage? Well, if you get blue light hitting a, pro a protein, and proteins are really important for all of our cell functions. They're the enzymes that make things happen. They're all the functions that happen in our cells. If it changes shape due to a, one of these molecules, a reactive oxygen species, altering its chemistry, it can no longer work potentially. And then you've got a problem. You've now got an individual protein that doesn't work. It's, it's not functional. It can also do things to phospholipids. These are the things that make up your cell membranes. Every cell in your body is full of cell membranes. And as you'll see in a second, photoreceptors have a lot of it. It's really important. But if you change the structure of those phospholipids, they change the permeability of the membrane, they change the structure and function of that membrane. And also your DNA and RNA, and that's really important because this is the code for all the proteins and parts of your cells and the functions of your cells. So reactive oxygen species can change the amino acid sequence, which is like the letters in the word of the codes, or they can even cause binding across, so cross-linking, and those, some of those things are repairable and some of them aren't. And we'll talk a little bit about the impact of that long-term in a moment. So I said I'd look at photoreceptors. So here's a typical photoreceptor. It, you can see at the bottom, it has a lot of phospholipid bilayer, and that's important because that could be damaged by reactive oxygen species and blue light. It also has mitochondria. Your photoreceptors in your retina and your fovea are the, the most metabolically active part of your body. Um, these cells last your entire life. So unlike your skin that's exposed to blue light all the time and ultraviolet, those cells are replaced every five days. Your photoreceptors are stuck with you for life. All of your central nervous system, that's it. They're never replaced. So they can accumulate damage through your life. And the way they can accumulate damage is through damage to different parts of these structures. So the proteins are replaceable. They can be repaired. That's fine. The RNA is constantly being replaced. That's fine. The phospholipid bilayers are being replaced all the time. Those aren't really a problem. It's not good. It's not great to be damaging them. And that's what a lot of short-term damage does. But they are repairable. But when you get to the DNA and the mitochondrial DNA, now you've got a problem. Some of that damage can be repaired and some can't be. And as you accumulate damage through life, it can become a problem. If you were to take the DNA from one of your cells and pull it out, it would be six microns wide and two meters long and contains three billion base pairs. That's, I can't get my head around that. That's a lot. So you can imagine that if blue photons are hitting that long string of DNA and they occasionally cause damage to one of those amino acid sequences and cause one of the proteins to get miscoded and you can't write that protein anymore, the probability of that happening to a particular protein is low. You've got three billion base pairs. Okay, fine. And the best part is you're all endowed with a maternal and a paternal copy of every one of your genes. So you've got a backup pair. Unless you're a male, then you're unfortunate because you have one gene, your chron chromosome, your X chromosome, you didn't get two copies of. Sorry, guys. Out of luck. But for the rest of us, we have two copies of everything. I don't. And you, if your damage happens to one particular protein, that's okay. You've got the maternal copy now. So then the probability of damage happening to that exact same protein on the same place on that three billion code, it's very low. Very low. But over 100 years' time, it could indeed happen. And that's what we think happens with aging, that you accumulate damage through time by damage to both mitochondrial DNA and chromosomal DNA. And once that happens, you start to lose different proteins in the cells. They start to not function properly. And they accumulate damage, and they start to die. So what does that look like then with respect to age-related macular degeneration? Well, on the left-hand side, you've got a young, healthy eye. And one of the key processes there is that the photoreceptors, every morning, they shed part of that outer segment. So I talked about all that phospholipid bilayer, all those proteins, the visual pigments. These things are stacked with it. And it actually gets dangerous if you leave it there. It's exposed to light, and it can create damage. So the cells go about the retinal pigment epithelium, those brown cells at the bottom. They recycle that and constantly regenerate it. And in a normal process, they become phagosomes. Then it's taken down to the bottom, and it's digested and released, and some of it goes back into the bloodstream and gets reused, and then new ones are built. And that's great. In an aging, diseased retina, 
this starts to break down. There's two reasons why this can break down. One is that if you imagine the enzyme that's breaking those phagosomes down is like a, a lock, and the, and the phagosomes, the part that you break down is like the key, right? Either one of those, if they change shape, the system doesn't work. And that's the way enzymes are. The breakdown of enzymes, of molecules in your body, depends on enzymes, and they have to have a lock and key mechanism. So if the photoreceptor outer segments are damaged in some way, that's the key coming down to be recycled. If it doesn't fit the lock anymore, it can't be recycled, and it builds up and accumulates. And that forms what we call lipofusin. It creates these phagolycosomes phago with lipofusin, it builds up and can get deposited as drusen. The other side of that is if the enzyme itself in the retinal pigment epithelium gets damaged, it can't break down the outer segments anymore. And that could also cause that. And these are not mutually exclusive. Either or both of those could be happening. So there's, we can't point our fingers at any one. That's why AMD is so difficult to define, because we're talking about cell death and accumulation of damage. But any part of that process could be misfunctioning and still result in the same outcome, that you have this buildup of drusen. Okay, what about the macular pigments? What are they? Where are they found? What's their role in vision? So macular pigments are carotenoids. They are lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin. There are 600 carotenoids in the natural world. There are 50 in your diet, 20 of which get into your bloodstream and your tissues, and three are concentrated at a thousand times greater concentration than any other carotenoid in your body. And they are lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin. And they end up in one place in your body. They end up here in your macula lutea. And it's the reason you have this yellow spot. It's full of these carotenoids. And they are particularly bound to the Henle fiber. So these are the photoreceptor um, outer segment neurons that lead off all the way to the ganglion cells, all the way to your brain. And they're bound to those. And they create these just different density distributions. So if we look at the bottom, I've got those three plots. These are not the shape of the macula. This is a three-dimensional distribution of the density of macular pigments in different people's eyes. And there's five different profiles. I've shown you the three main ones here. The one on the left is people that have a very high density of macular pigment in the very center of their eye. The one in the middle suggests that you can have this sort of more even distribution across the whole macula. And the one on the right is this sort of central dip, where there's not as much in the very center. And so it's different between each of us. And it's not just difference in shape, it's difference in amount. So some people have so little macular pigment, we can't even measure it. It's really, really low. Some people have loads. So it's highly variable between individuals. Macular pigments absorb blue light very, very well. It's one of the things they do best. And it just so happens that you recall at the beginning, I talked about that ISO standard aphakic light hazard. Well, the part that sits in the blue I've shown there, you can see that the match is remarkably good. And that's because this is nature's way of protecting you from that blue light through time. They put these exact macular pigments in this place to protect a part of the retina where you know there's very little vascularization, there's a high oxygen tension, highest metabolic rate of any part of your central nervous system. There's lots going on, and it's a place that could be easily damaged. So nature has put these macular pigments there for a reason to protect you. But by absorbing blue light, they do more than just protect your retina. They also improve your vision. So blue light is highly scattered. Short wavelengths are more scattered than long wavelengths. So if you put light through a prism, it breaks out into its rainbow, and you see that the red light almost goes straight through, and the blue light bends a lot. Well, when blue light enters your eye, it does the same thing, it scatters. So if you're looking at bright lights like I am right now, you get a lot of scatter. Luckily, I've got lots of macular pigments. It's not bothering me too much. But some of us find driving at night with headlights or looking into the sun quite difficult. And in fact, that's because you get a lot of scatter. And if your macular pigments are low, they're not blocking some of that scatter. What can happen is the light's meant to go straight through your eye, through the lens, and into a particular photoreceptor. It needs to go in a straight line right to those photoreceptors in order to keep the image. But you can imagine that if a few photons get bent in the process, they end up in the wrong photoreceptors. And then what you get is what's called a signal-to-noise ratio problem. So you're getting uh, photons ending up in photoreceptors where they shouldn't. And your eye can't tell that they're not supposed to be there, so it gets a little bit of a signal. And that's that glare you get. It's like looking through a fog. When you look through a fog, the image you're trying to see is here, but the light that's coming is being scattered by all the water molecules in the air. Well, the same thing can happen inside your eye. Now, the key is that that mostly happens in the blue wavelengths. So the macular pigments are put in a position where you're trying to get really high acuity vision. Your cones are placed really, really closely together. It's for high acuity, and you're trying to stop that scatter and crosstalk between photoreceptors. So that's what they do. 
So they improve, they improve your glare disability, make it easier to see. They also improve contrast because, again, contrast is all about how well you can see in this photoreceptor versus this one at every given time. And if I decrease the contrast, your ability to see between those two photoreceptors depends on the signal to noise ratio between the two. And if there's a lot of noise, your signal to noise ratio is poor and you can't see the difference. Now, in our daily lives, this is rarely a problem. Most of us read books in black and white, not gray and white or white on white. Most of us aren't worried anymore about being hunted down by lions on the African safari at dusk and dawn. But there was a time when contrast sensitivity was so important to our lives that it meant the difference between life and death. And that's what would have driven us to have these systems in place to make sure we survived. Now, that can still happen today. If you've got good contrast sensitivity, you can probably see that there's three cars in this image. If you're driving down the motorway on a rainy day, which never happens in the UK, of course, you can tell from my accent I'm not from here. Um, when you're driving down the motorway on a rainy day and there's all this spray came up and you've got this problem of having difficulty seeing, your contrast sensitivity is what allows you to see the change in contrast as you get closer or farther away from a vehicle. If one of those three vehicles was stopped and I was traveling at a reasonable speed of 50 miles an hour, I'd have a hard time stopping in that sort of condition, which is why we slow down in fog. But your contrast sensitivity would give you that extra few milliseconds to get your foot to the brake and stop in time. So there are times when contrast sensitivity is really important, and most of the time it's around dusk and dawn, which happens to be the time where often we're commuting back and forth. We should really change our workday and not commute at the worst time for seeing when we're switching between our crepuscular and diurnal vision. It's just ridiculous. Anyways, another, another challenge. But we've taken advantage of these things in our daily lives. We, people that do a lot of things where they have to deal with contrast wear special glasses that help them see through that contrast problem. Um, pilots, race car drivers, skiers will often use yellow lenses when there's an issue with contrast. You note that they're yellow, just like the macular pigments. It's doing the exact same thing. If they had good macular pigments, they probably wouldn't need the glasses, but it would probably still help. Okay. So the macular pigments that are blocking blue light, as I say, and that matches almost perfectly with um, the retinal light hazard. We also know that the ultraviolet light's already being blocked by the lens and the cornea, and that these macular pigments are sitting exactly in the right location, right in front of your photoreceptors to do their job. So there's the macular pigment absorbance overlaid against that retinal light hazard, and it's a really good match. The other thing they do is they act as antioxidants. Now, it's well established that all carotenoids are antioxidants, and they're really useful in our body. They're found throughout our body, and our body uses them to do exactly what it should do. Reactive oxygen species are generated naturally through our metabolism and through toxins we take in and through blue light, but our body needs to deal with those. So they incorporate carotenoids all over the place. And the reason they work as carotenoids is because they're long, skinny molecules with what's called a, a, a conjugated pi orbital. That's complicated. Basically, it means you see those little lines down the middle where there's a single and a double, single and a double? Well, they're sharing carbon atoms in a way that allows them to have a dipole moment, which means that they can change their charge back and forth. It makes them flexible. What it allows them to do is take a reactive oxygen species and dissipate or neutralize it, its charge. And then it can be recycled with the release of heat, which means that Carotenoids are really good at dealing with reactive oxygen species. They can neutralize them so they don't cause damage, and that's what you want. So you want to have lots of carotenoids in your body at all times to help you deal with these reactive oxygen species. And most of the time, this is a recyclable process, but not all the time. So on occasion, reactive oxygen species actually bind to these carotenoids and use them up which is why you need to replace them, and you only get them from your diet. You can't make these things, so you've got to eat them. It's really important. And you will use them up over time. So if you're a smoker, you're using them up all the time because you're releasing reactive oxygen species in your system, and you'll have low macular pigments. So if you're a smoker, come on over, and I'll measure your macular pigments, and you'll see they're low. But likewise, if you're getting a lot of sun, same thing. You're exposing yourself, and you're damaging your, your macular pigments. All right, so with respect to AMD then, these macular pigments are sitting in a layer above your retina. They're also found in your cornea, your lens, and your RP. They're just not in the same densities, but they're still there performing the same function. So it's important that we eat enough of them. And they're doing exactly what we want them to. They're blocking the blue light and acting as reactive oxygen species to defend these areas where we know that we can have damage in AMD. Okay, so what's the evidence for all this? I'm going to walk you through a couple of areas where there's a perfect parallel between the risk factors for AMD and what we know about macular pigments. So we all know that a key risk factor for AMD is age. And there's good evidence that macular pigments decrease through your life. 
They decrease with age, so that's important. And they can also get used up, so you need to have enough. Thank you. Smoking is a prime risk factor for AMD. The odds ratios for smokers are four to one. Much higher odds of getting AMD if you're a smoker, and that's really clear and well established. Interestingly enough, not based on long-term clinical studies, controlled studies, by the way. Nope. Um, but it's also shown that smoking reduces your macular pigments. Again, the reactive oxygen species are using up your macular pigments, so smokers tend to have lower macular pigments. Drusen and AMD in the fellow eye. We know that's a major risk factor for AMD in the next eye. And again, macular pigments are always lower in people that already have large amounts of drusen or have AMD in their fellow eye, and that's been done numerous times. Poor diet's critical as well, and that's one of the risk factors. So if you go to the Macular Society, they'll tell you all of these things are key risk factors for AMD. What we know about that for macular pigments is that you can only get your macular pigments from your diet, and therefore if you've got a poor diet, your macular pigments will typically be low. But conversely, a good diet will supplement your macular pigment levels and keep you healthier for longer. Sunlight exposure is a risk factor for AMD, as we talked about before, and I'll talk about it again in a moment. And Sunlight exposure will reduce your macular pigment levels, but more importantly, the macular pigment levels will protect you from that sunlight. So that's really critical. And obesity, that's one that often surprises people. And the reason that obesity, we don't know exactly why it's linked to AMD, although it may be because of the macular pigments, but we do know why it's linked to macular pigment levels. And that's because carotenoids are, well, the, the lutein zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin are lipid soluble. They're absorbed in our fats. And in our normal lives, in our natural lives, we would go out in the summertime, in the fall, and harvest lots of healthy foods and eat them. And we get all our carotenoids and vitamins and minerals in the summer. And then we go into the wintertime, and we would have stored fats in the summer, and we would release those things from our fats slowly over time. So we would have macular pigments for the occasional sunny days in winter. Think about today's life, though. Nowadays, we store all the stuff in our fats, but we never have a winter. We don't release those fats again. We just keep accumulating. And what we're doing is we're actually fighting with our eyes for the source of those macular pigments. So rather than all of it going to our eyes, well, we're storing a lot for later, but we're never releasing it for later. And you can see this. If you feed carotenoids to animals, all their fat turns orange. So they, there was a farmer once in the US who had a surplus of carrots. He fed it to his pigs, and he couldn't sell the meat because the meat was basically all mottled with orange fat. They go straight to the fats. And finally, that AMD is linked directly to macular pigmentation through numerous studies. And the one that I'd like to tell you about now is Fletcher et al., um, 2008. And this is a really nice study. But there's numerous studies that have linked directly the, the macular pigments to age-related macular degeneration. So here is this Fletcher et al. study. So this is the European Eye Study, Your Eye. It looked at 4,753 participants. It was an epidemiological study over time. And what they looked at was the likelihood of developing AMD. So it gives you an odds ratio. And an odds ratio of exactly one means you're no more likely to develop AMD than anyone else. So that's no change. And when they looked at everybody in the study, they found that you can see those blue dots. The blue dots are all above one, but it wasn't significantly above one. So on average, while it is dangerous to be exposed to blue light, it didn't affect everybody equally. And that's because there's lots of other variables going on. We can't control everything. However, when we looked at the people that had low macular pigments, vitamin C and vitamin E, so the key components of the ARIDS formula, these antioxidants are really important, suddenly the odds ratios went up dramatically. In fact, the odds ratio for some of these people, for the average, was 3.72. It's only slightly below that of smoking. So low macular pigments combined with exposure to blue light is a risk factor for AMD. And the important thing there is that means that macular pigments are preventative. Now, you may have heard of the ARED studies. The ARED studies said that they're not preventative. How long did the ARED studies go on for? Five years. Five years and five years. That's not long enough to see a preventative effect if we're talking about accumulation through life. Right? It's just not going to happen. So this is a really lovely study. Again, I'm happy to share that with you if you'd like a copy. The other study that I really like is this one that was done. It was um, presented last year at Cambridge. It was a controlled study. So this is where we can do controlled studies on animals that are not so dissimilar to us. And this is great. So macaque, rhesus macaques, if I were to give you a cross-section of their retina, you wouldn't be able to tell them different from a human. They're exactly the same. All the same layers, everything's identical. Even the proportion of red, green, and blue cones is exactly the same. And they have macular pigments. They are just like us. Some people would argue we didn't come from them, but I assure you we have. So this study looked at these macaques. And what it did is that we were able to control everything in their lives, essentially. So they had a very large troop of macaques. And they took the population, they divided it into two. 
And then they took the offspring of the mothers that they'd already controlled the diet in. So they divided the group into two, and they gave one half a perfectly normal diet with normal food, not dissimilar to what we would eat. And the other half, they gave them everything except for carotenoids. There was no macular pigments in there, no lutein, no zeaxanthin, no mesozeaxanthin. And they followed the offspring through life. So they made sure that nothing was transferred to the mothers, to the babies. And then animals, so they, they graded their retinas on the same for, system they used for the ARED study. And the animals that had a normal diet developed moderate and severe drusen, 30% of them, by age 18, which is the equivalent age of 65 in humans. So this matches really well with what we see in humans. By about 65, we're getting a lot of severe drusen. But when they looked at the animals that they had starved of any macular pigments at all, what they found was that they got severe and moderate drusen at the equivalent age of 35, so half the age. This clearly points out that macular, because that's all that was different, they lived everywhere else exactly the same. The only thing different was that they had no macular pigments. So that clearly shows that it's preventative in drusen, which we know to be one of the precursors to AMD. All right, last part, assessing macular pigments. How do we do it? How do we measure macular pigments? And I'm going to argue that you can't measure macular pigments. The reason is the macular pigments in the eye, and I can't sit there and count the hair. I can count the hairs in your head, but I can't count the macular pigments. I can't measure every individual macular pigment. So everything we do to measure macular pigments is actually an assessment, I call it. It's a correlation. We measure something that's correlated with the amount of macular pigment in your eye. They, they just can't be measured. If you wanted to measure them, you'd have to extract the retina, and then you'd have to run an HPLC column, high-performance liquid chromatography. And even then, you're not measuring. You're looking at the amount that comes to the column at a particular time in the element. It's, it's not measuring. It's, it's, it's assessment. But it's as close as you could get. But we don't want to pull people's eyes out, do we? So instead, we'll do it in vivo, and we'll look at the various ways you can assess macular pigments in vivo. Um, so remember that the, the macular pigments absorb very heavily in the blue. So most of the technologies that have been looked at look at the difference in absorption in blue light versus green light. And there are numerous techniques, and they can be divided into two main categories, physical or objective measurements, or optical measurements, and psychophysical measurements. And on the physical or optical side, you've got reflectometry, where you can direct light into the eye and look at the reflections back of blue versus green, and then look at the patterns that are created. Uh, Raman spectroscopy is a bit of a, an outlier in the sense that you use a monochromatic laser and you look at the way that it excites molecules and puts out different spectra, and that's, that's a bit different. But probably the, one of the best known systems on this right now is autofluorescence. Thank you. So um, the Heidelberg spectralis uses dual wavelength autofluorescence to measure um, the macular pigments in the eye, and it uses lasers at 488 that are absorbed by the macular pigments and 514 that aren't. Now, the key assumptions you have to look at or the limitations of making measurements this way are that the pupil needs to be dilated, so that's important, and that there's no variance across the retina in whatever it is you're using. So for um, dual wavelength autofluorescence, you're so looking at the reflection back of lipofusin, and you're assuming that there's no variance across in that. And also that the intervening optics don't interfere with whatever laser or light you're putting in. That's really important. So for the psychophysical measurements, there's been two main methods. There's heterochromatic flick photometry and motion photometry. They both use the same fundamental principle. That is that the human looks at some sort of pattern, whether it be flashing or movement, and they look at it in green light and blue light, and they look at the difference in certain areas, and that allows them to then measure the macular pigments. The limitations of these systems are that the subject must be actively participating in what's going on, that they have normal macular function, because, of course, you're using your, their eye as the sensor, and that, again, that the intervening optics aren't interfering. So on the market now, presently, you can get the uh, Maculux, macular metrics device. Uh, it uses heterochromatic flick photometry. It'll measure different locations across the retina, and it does so using heterochromatic flick photometry. It, it takes quite a while to do the measurement, and it can be quite difficult. Um, the MPS2 or Quantify uses the same technology. It removes one of the components, which is the peripheral measurement, which is a bit difficult. Uh, it takes between 3 and 10 minutes, depending on who you've got working, and it measures it at the central peak. The Heidelberg Spectralis is a fantastic device using dual wavelength autofluorescence. It can give you the full outline of the total macular pigments, the volume, any different location you like. Uh, it takes about a couple of minutes. It's quite fast. You do need to dilate and wait for the dilation. Unfortunately, it's not yet available, but they promise it will be out soon, and that'll be a great device when it's available. But there's also a new way, and I'll just tell you quickly about the research that I've done looking at how we can measure macular pigments in a totally different way. So you remember I said that these macular pigments are long, thin molecules. They absorb blue light. But they also particularly absorb polarized light. So when the light is polarized in the same axis as the molecule, the long axis, it's heavily absorbed by the molecule. But when it comes the opposite direction, perpendicular to the molecule, it's not absorbed at all. So we can use that difference in absorption to measure the amount of macular pigment. 
So when we look at the way the macular pigments are aligned, these are these long, skinny molecules. They're bound to the Henle fibers that emanate out from the center of the fovea like the spokes of a wheel. And they're bound perpendicularly to those. So you create these concentric circles. And if I then shine polarized light onto that system, that's, these things absorb in the blue, if I put po vertical polarized light onto that, what they do is all the molecules that are aligned with that will absorb, and the ones that aren't won't absorb. And if I subtract blue from white, I'm left with yellow. So what you see is this effect called Heidinger's brushes. You may have read about this once upon a time in optometry school. It's a very simple effect, and that's what you can see. And we can use that then to measure the macular pigments in the eye. So this new device, the MPI, is enabling us to measure macular pigments very rapidly. It takes only about, a, well, on average, 53 seconds. It's highly repeatable. It's really easy. And it gives you a measure of the overall volume of macular pigment in the eye. So feel free to stop by later on. I can measure your macular pigments for you. But the point of this, of developing this, is that I've just told you how important macular pigments are. We need to be screening all of our patients. So we wanted a device that could be used in regular clinical practice. It's so easy that you don't even have to run it as an optometrist, a dispensing optician, or even someone on the front counter can run it. So it's so easy. There's no reason we shouldn't be measuring everybody to tell them their risk factors. So why would we measure? Well, we know that it improves vision, improves contrast sensitivity, reduces glare disability. So just on that grounds alone, it's a useful thing to do. We also know that they protect the eye. They decrease blue light getting to the eye, and they act as antioxidants. And finally, there's actions you can do when you find somebody that's low, and that's the really important part. So if you find someone that's low, you can make recommendations. So if you make an OCT measurement and find that someone has a problem, what do you do? You refer them and they go away, and you can't help them anymore. But if you measure their macular pigments, you can actually do something for them in your own practice. You can give them advice how they can change their lifestyle and protect themselves through life. So we want you to be measuring young people early on so they can protect themselves and change their lifestyle. The things they can do is eat better. So eat their bright and dark fruits and vegetables and uh, make sure that they're getting enough. But they can also supplement if they want to. You need to reduce your exposure to bright light particularly blue light, so avoiding sunlight, sunglasses, hats, blue blocking lenses, transitions, whatever you like, all of those things will help reduce the amount of blue light entering the eye. Quit smoking is really important. You've already got one risk factor with low macular pigments. The last thing you want to do is have another one and multiply that further. And finally, losing weight is really important, as we talked about the, the metabolism of macular pigments. So the take-home messages then were that blue light is dangerous, that reactive oxygen species are causative in aging and AMD, that macular pigments can help protect the retina against blue light and reactive oxygen species, and that these macular pigments are variable between individuals, modifiable, and measurable. Thank you very much.